Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Three, chapter twenty six, fundamental principles of material nature, verse number twenty two. Swaja from Mavika writ from Swaja from Mavika writ from. Um, Lakshan <laughs> You already did this verse? She told me we just did it and you already did the verse. <laughs> okay. Shall we do the next one? Nobody told me <laughs> any verse. <laughs> I just took the next one that I did. Okay. Thank you. Verse 23 and 24, is it? Yeah. Okay. Mahatad <laughs> with <laughs> The ladies. Mm -hmm. 
Vanat, undergoing a change, Bhagavad Virya Sambhavad, evolved from the Lord's own energy, Kriya Shakti, endowed with active power, Ahankara, material ego, three Vida, of the three kinds, Samapadyata sprang up, Vikarika, material ego in the transformed goodness, Saijasa, material ego in passion, Cha, and Tamasa, material ego in ignorance, also. I'm sorry, Cha, also, Gita, from which Baba, the origin, Manasa, of the mind, Cha, and Indriyana, of the senses, for perception and action, Cha, and Bhutanam Mahatam. Five gross elements of the also. This interesting arrangement here. Translation. Now, this whole chapter is very technical in explaining how the living entity becomes contaminated and falls to the material world in different categories of material existence. So, here is the beginning of the ex explanation. The material ego springs up from the Mahatattva, which evolves from the Lord's own energy. The material ego is endowed with predominantly with the active power of three kinds, good, passion, and ignorant. It is from these types of material ego that the mind, the senses of perception, the organs of action, and the gross elements evolve. We can have a little understanding of how things begin in our sojourn in this material world. Purport. In the beginning, from clear consciousness or the pure state of Krishna consciousness, the first contamination sprang up. This is called false ego or identification of the body as the self. A living entity exists in this natural state of Krishna consciousness, but he has a marginal independence and this allows him to forget Krishna. 
Originally, pure Krishna consciousness exists, but because of misuse of marginal independence, there's a chance of forgetting Krishna. This is exhibited in actual life. There are many instances in which someone acting in Krishna consciousness suddenly changes. In the Upanishads, it is stated, therefore, the path of spiritual realization is just like the sharp edge of a razor. The example is very appropriate. One shaves his cheeks with a sharp razor very nicely, but as soon as his attention is diverted from the activity, he immediately cuts his cheek because he mishandles the razor. Not only must one come to the stage of pure Krishna consciousness, but one must also be very careful. Any inattentiveness or carelessness may cause fall down. This fall down is due to false ego. From the status of pure consciousness, the false ego is born because of the misuse of independence. We cannot argue about why false ego arises from pure consciousness. In fact, see, there is always a chance that this will happen. And therefore, one has to be very careful. False ego is the basic principle for all material existence, which are executed in the modes of material nature. As soon as one deviates from pure Krishna consciousness, he increases his entanglement in material reaction. The entanglement of materialism is the material mind, and from the material mind, the senses and material organs become manifest. So Mayan Kumanandas Maharaja Chaksun Militam Yenatas Mai Shri Guru Bhagavan Sama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Krishna Mutai Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namini Namaste Saraswati Vega Udavani Charine Here is a Sasunyavadi Pasyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa, Turumizja, Kripa, Sindhupe, Pacha, Patita, Namba, Vibhyo, Vaishnavibhyo, Namahumma, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadar, Siva, Siddhi, Gaur, Bhaktavindu, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Umira Padaloba, you come the Nobi, Chahankarti, Etiame, Venapakriti Astada, Earth, Water, Fire, Air, Ether, Mind, Intelligence, and the False Ego make up all the material elements. As is explained by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, there are five gross elements and three subtle elements. Uh, but the living entity comes to the material world through the subtle elements, and as the subtle elements manifest, the gross elements start to manifest. So the first contamination is mentioned here, and that the living entity is swarat. Swarat means that we have independence, and that independence is the nature of the soul's existence, because we are part and parcel of Krishna. He is swarat in complete. In other words, his independence is complete. There is no one that can check that independence. But our independence also exists, but in a marginal manifestation. In other words, it exists in a, in a, in a minute form. And what is that independence? We can choose between the spiritual and the material. And if we choose the material, then the whole process of contamination starts to unfold. And here is how the living entity falls to the material world. Well, misuse of one's independence, which is one part of one's natural constitutional position. Prabhupada said there's no need to argue about how it happened. It happened. <laughs> uh, in the sense that um, one starts to identify from something which is different than oneself. And Jivar Surupai Krishna Nitya Das, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema Sadhu Kamuloi Sabi Swamanali Chitti Kodi Ayudoi. These are statements that actually give the identity of the living entity. Pure 
soul which is uncontaminated by anything material and has eternal loving nature towards the Supreme Lord. But somehow, just like the sun sits brightly in the sky <clears throat> on a clear day, but then sometimes a cloud moves in front of the sun. Although the sun remains pure and is not affected by the cloud, the cloud does cover the sun from a particular perspective from those of us who are below the sun. But the sun is always pure. So our natural pure consciousness gets covered by this, what is this misidentification with oneself as being something other than a, a soul, in other words, pure and spiritual energy. And the first manifestation is false ego. When I did that, uh, this body is me. And that's the first thing. And then as it manifests, as it explains here, then the material mind starts to come. And from the material mind, then all of the gross elements start to manifest the earth, water, fire, air. Well, it's actually the other way. It's ether, air, fire. No, ether, air, fire, yes, water, and earth. So um, existence comes from subtle to gross, and destruction comes from gross to subtle. Each contains the element of the previous, and as it manifests itself, Accordingly, each of the elements are manifested. And when destruction comes, each of the elements go back into the other elements and ultimately back into the false ego. <clears throat> this is very technical, but it's nice to know because this false ego is the cause of all of the uh, attachments that one has in this material world. Uh, if, we, if we didn't have a body, we wouldn't have with any attachments, but because we have a body and a mind, we have attachments. So it's explained also in the 10th canto by Lord Brahma explains that, that society, friends, family, nation, all of this is due to the fact that we have a body, a material body. And because of that, then we identify with all of these things, and all of this identity is part of the first principle of misidentification, which is called the false ego. So in that, that false sense of understanding, one acts in the wrong way. That's why, <clears throat> that's why we could say, and Prabhupada would also say, everyone in the material world is crazy because they don't know who they are. If you know who you are, then that's one thing, but if you don't know who you are, then that's an sign of insanity. I remember when we were many years ago, we were, <clears throat> this is my first experience with the Hare Krishnas back in 1970, when I uh, saw them in Washington, DC. I saw these devotees, they looked like him, <laughs> orange with big ponytails and some girls dressed with saris. And they were going around, they were giving out incense and books, and, not books, but incense and pamphlets. And one of the pants pamphlets they were giving out was um, a double title, two, two subject matters that Prabhupada had wrote. One was Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And the other one is Who is Crazy? That was the title. Maybe you've seen that pamphlet. And Prabhupada, was a, that was a responsive article to uh, people who are saying, you guys are crazy. You know, you look like something from another planet. You, you, you know, no hair. In those days, that was unusual. Now everybody is following us. They even have ponytails too. And so, yeah, that was a, that's the way it was. And they were saying, you, you're crazy. So Prabhupada wrote a response. He said, you say we are crazy and we say you are crazy. So let's discuss. <laughs> so and then the, the foundation for the argument is if you don't know who you are, that's the sign of craziness. If you think you're something, then who you actually are, then you have a problem. So the living entity thinks 
that they're this body. And therefore they act according to that body. And because of that, they make everything they do is wrong. <laughs> one and one is three, right? As soon as you do a mathematical calculation, you have to, in order to do something very complex, the basic math has to be correct. Otherwise, if you start off with the wrong basic math, then you may be expert at doing the rest correctly, but everything is wrong because the basis is not there. If you want to build a house and you want the house to be strong, then you put a lot of time and effort in the foundation. So that same principle is actually there. The, this idea of misidentification with oneself is the, the cause of the material existence, not knowing who we are. And therefore, all activities are just my shrama eva he came on. It's a waste of time. Although we might think they were very important, but they're a waste of time because they have nothing to do with us unless we are engaged in devotional service. Then we are come, we are dissolving the false ego. The dissolving of the false ego is bringing one back again to one's actual understanding of oneself. And here Prabhupada says <clears throat> that um, even one who becomes Krishna conscious, even though if they have attained, let me say, pure Krishna consciousness, there's a chance due to the nature of the material energy and due to the independence that the living entity has, that they can again fall into the material world. And in that fall down, then one again is again in the wrong consciousness. We have the example of a Javil in the Bhagavatam. Young boy, Brahmin, very pious, religious, beautiful family, had a young wife. Hey, his life was very simple and very devotional. Walking along the street one day, going to going to gather some groceries, he happened to see something that he shouldn't have watched. <clears throat> It was a sudra and a sudrani, man and woman. She was a prostitute, and it was a, they were acting very licentiously in public. He, his mind caught that. And the image that he saw stayed in his mind so strongly. You must have, you also have that experience. Sometimes some image hits your mind and you can't get rid of it. Prabhupada even talks about himself. He said, I was, when I travel, I have to travel on these airplanes. And they played the movie, you know. In those days, they had one big screen for everybody. Right up in the front, big screen, and then everyone could be watching the same screen. That was in the old days. The Prabhupada said, yes. And I said, I, I, sometimes I would look, and then, I, then these images would get stuck in my mind. Of course, Prabhupada didn't have any problem, but he was just explaining how the conditioned soul gets contaminated by visual, by visual, uh, visual contact. And that can happen. Somebody here sees something, all of a sudden the mind makes an impression, the impression goes deeper into the consciousness, and it keeps rising back up because the mind is very impressionable. So therefore, we see in the example of Ajamil how simply meditating, or not meditating, but gazing upon something that he shouldn't have been looking at, his whole life changed. He chased after that prostitute, married her, and because she was a very high-class person, in other words, she, had, she lived very exuriously, and he, was, he didn't have any of that, so he took to crime in order to support his his wife. He was stealing, cheating, lying, kidnapping, doing all of these things just to get money to support his wife. And that was his whole life. And it wasn't until he was 88 years old that he actually changed again, back to where he was. But that was by the mercy of a great soul. So that's, that's the prime example of the Shastras, how and these are not just 
rare occasions. We see even devotees somehow or other. I just remember I was I was uh, talking to one brahmachari, and this was in Croatia, and and he was traveling and preaching and distributing books. He was a fixed up brahmachari by himself. And during the summertime, he was going to vacation areas and living in hotels and distributing books. He was quite good. One day he was on his computer and he hit the wrong button. Because he hit the wrong button, something came up there which he shouldn't have saw. And somehow or other, his mind dwelled on it. And it somehow all of a sudden it was there and he was watching. And then, after a while, later on, he told me, he said, you know, after that, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't distribute books anymore. I couldn't chant. My whole spiritual life has been pretty much destroyed. Simply by that, maybe a minute or so, not even, of an image that came up on the screen. And then, of course, because he was a serious devotee, he took good association and gradually, after many, many months, he actually came back to his Krishna consciousness. But that's another example which I was personally involved with. You, uh, that this is the way of this material energy. One has to be very careful. Padam padam ya vi padam sham. It's a difficult place. There's danger at every step, <clears throat> especially for those who are in the renounced order of life. There are so many objects of sense gratification that are being purviewed in one's vision that and at any time one can somewhat be subjected to some of these things. And then, depending how strong you are in your spiritual life, you may be, even if you're strong, you may also be affected. We see that. So, yeah, this is the danger of this material. And there's other ways also, not only by the visual, simply by hearing something that you shouldn't have heard. You may also, that may also echo in one's consciousness and cause one disturbance in the mind. And when you try to chant, that mind, that, that sound vibration comes again. So you have to be very careful. It's a dangerous place. As Prabhupada used the example, and I think it's not an over, it's not a, an over exaggeration. The uh, example of a <clears throat> shaving with a sharp razor. And the one is not very attentive, and a little inattention, and there's some slip. So then this is what we can. So therefore, this false ego is the foundation by which all of our material activities unfold. Therefore, they say when as one's becoming purified in Krishna consciousness, the purification goes through two levels of existence: the gross and then the subtle. When devotees give up, they follow the four regular principles. No illicit sex, no intoxication, no eating, no gamble, gambling. They somewhat become purified from the material contamination. In other words, the gross activities. But then the subtle, uh, the subtle activities of the mind, which are the grassroots of the material activities, are still there. Just like you... When you're cutting a grass, you may be cutting with a lawnmower and you cut it very clean. But because the seed is still, the bud is still, the plant is still in the ground, it'll grow back. When you cut weeds too, you have to pull them out from the root. Otherwise the root will again cause the plant to grow once again. So the subtle aspects of our material contamination are the ones that devotees fight really hard with. <clears throat> what is it? Adder, uh, adoration, distinction, profit, adoration, and distinction. These things also are there in the subtle aspects. So although one may be free, apparently, from the gross types of activity, that subtle is there, and those subtles if we don't kill them, then the growth will come back again. 
just like you know the grass will grow back again if, the, if it's not pulled out by the root. Now that means that one has to be very diligent in the practice of spiritual life. One cannot be inattentive or careless, because if one is inattentive or careless, and all of a sudden, and the more you make advancement in spiritual life, the more that Maya tries to knock you out. But in proportion to your advancement, the challenges and the tests that Maya give you are always in proportion to your level of development. In other words, Krishna will not allow Maya to test you beyond your ability to uh, succeed or pass the test. If Krishna wants, or Maya wants, she can knock you out in a second. It's not, it's not a problem for her. <laughs> it's easy. <laughs> but Krishna won't allow that to happen because he protects his devotee. But he does allow Maya to attack us to up to a level where we can survive the test. But sometimes devotees think these tests are too much. And then they go away or they give up or they fail the test. But it's not like that. It's just that Krishna will allow that in order for one devotee to reach down deeper into their own Krishna consciousness and pull out the strength that they need to pass the test. In other words, Krishna allows Maya to do that so to make us stronger. To make us stronger. So don't be... Don't be disturbed by what we say, a test and that come by way of devotional service. They're all meant to bring us, but we have to be careful and not to somehow or other put ourselves in a situation where we're in a material situation that is overwhelming. It's like, <laughs> this is a good one. When Prabhupada was in New York, um, The reporters came to meet Prabhupada at the airport and they had their cameras, they had their, you know, notepads. So they were, because uh, Prabhupada was a big thing in those days, you know, this guru from India and all of us had all of these Western disciples. And was really, our, our movement was really powerful in America. In fact, it was so powerful that one senator, I forget what state he said, as Krishna consciousness continues, it'll take over the government in 10 years. That's how powerful we were. This movement was really powerful. And Prabhupada also told us, he said, we can take over the world in 18 days. And he wasn't just saying that, but he said, you're not ready. You haven't come up to the standard yet. Why? Because his movement is fueled by the Supreme Lord himself. It's not something that's coming from this material energy coming from the spiritual world. It's very powerful. It's extremely powerful. And as devotees make advancement, they also become very powerful. Extremely powerful. Devotees can do amazing things. Things that are beyond the ordinary. And just the way we spread Krishna. Look how fast Prabhupada spread Krishna consciousness. In, in not even 10 years, and 11 years, he, he brought Krishna consciousness and temples all around the world. And that was one person who just had a bunch of monkeys following him. That was us. Just like Prabhupada said, yeah. Uh, Ram had to cross the ocean in order to res rescue Sita. So he had a bunch of monkeys followers to assist Ram. Ram could have did it himself. But in order to engage his disciples and followers and in the, in the act of devotion, he had all the, Prabhupada said, I have gathered a few monkeys and I've crossed the ocean trying to rescue Sita. <laughs> See the problem. <laughs> so that's us. And, uh, but uh, devotees can become very, very influential, very powerful, just like when we distribute books. How is it possible you walk up to someone, they have no idea, but they don't want to even know anything about spiritual life. And pretty soon they're buying a book. <laughs> that, is, that is the power of Krishna consciousness. One can speak in such a way, it's one of the mystic powers to attract a person's mind, to, do, to allow them to do anything you want them to do, simply by the power of speech. 
That's one mystic power. So devotees have that when they do book distribution. They have developed that. So Prabhupada was in New York and all these reporters were there. And then uh, one reporter was really envious of Prabhupada. I mean, he was outwardly envious. So he said to Prabhupada, he said, because uh, the devotees had brought well, he's had brought a Vyasa son from the temple into the airport. <laughs> That's how they, yeah, and they would bring the whole Vyasa stuff. And so Prabhupada, sometimes he wouldn't bother with that, but this time he sat on it. And then he was taking questions from the, uh, from the, the reporters. So the reporter got envious. He said, why do you have to sit on that fancy seat? So, I mean, how many ways can you answer that question? The problem, I answered it in a very, let me say, amazing and surprising way. He said, the difference between you and me is I can be in a room full of naked women and not be disturbed. And so when he said that, all his colleagues started to laugh at him. <laughs> and then he kind of kind of shrunk down, realizing he was who he was dealing with. <laughs> so, you know, now, Prabhupada wasn't an ordinary personality. He came from the spiritual world to do this work. But uh, that example is there that unless one, no, we can't use that example. That's not good. But unless one is sees Krishna face to face, which is a very high level of bhakti, that's not a high level, it's, the, it's perfection of bhakti, one can fall down at any time. Even on the platform of love of God, one can fall. But the higher stages of love of God is see Krishna face to face. Well, I said, just like I'm seeing you and you're seeing me, you can see Krishna like that, same way. But that, that stage of consciousness is the epitome of your devotional service. So Prabhupada was on that stage. <laughs> When someone asked Prabhupada, are you seeing Krishna? He said, there was never a time I wasn't. <laughs> he couldn't even remember when he was not seeing Krishna. So this is an example of the power of devotional service. One can meet Krishna face, and when Prabhupada said, you can also talk to Krishna. You can ask him questions and he'll give you answers. You can even tell him what to do. <laughs> in a very loving way, of course. So that is the power of this devotional service. But material energy is very powerful also. So unless one re has reached pure consciousness, as it's mentioned here, and one should be very, very aware that the material energy is what is called um, immutable. I mean, it's always changing. It's precarious. It's very difficult to understand, and it's impossible to control. So one has to be very careful in the practice of Krishna. Keep your mind, Prabhupada said, and he quotes a verse, I can't remember that verse, that if you look straight ahead, you see Krishna. If you look in any other direction, there's Maya. So Maya is everywhere, and Krishna is in one place. <laughs> Okay. So now what does that mean? That, that we have to practice devotional service in such a way that we keep our focus on the Supreme Personality of God. Either be absorbed in the service, or that's the preliminary stage of purification, or actually be absorbed in Krishna while you're executing the service. That is the higher stage of bhakti. Well, both stages are... are achievements even in one if one is absorbed in doing the service one doesn't want to even see anything else but what is necessary for executing that service even if they're around many many 
other people and many things are going on still the absorption in the service is taking the consciousness to the spiritual platform one has to practice that so these verses here are giving us more or less a subtle understanding of the nature of our the contamination and how powerful the material energy is uh, it's very powerful there's a story of the past uh, time one great sage Markandeya Rish in the 12th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Markandeya Rish had, had reached perfection in devotional service. He had his own ashram, he had followers, and he had he had uh, reached pure Krishna consciousness. Uh, the Lord wanted to give him a benediction, so the Lord appeared to him and asked him, take a benediction from me. Anything you want? But he asked for the most unusual thing. He said, I want to see the power of your material energy. Krishna said, are you sure? <laughs> he was warning him ahead of time, but he was, that's what he wanted. And so Krishna did that. And then the cosmic creation started to go into dissolution. And all the worlds were started to flood with all of the rain that comes because when this planet gets destroyed, the first thing that happens is the sun starts to get hotter and comes closer to the earth and burns the earth and then there's fire on the whole earth. The whole, the whole, the whole uh, universe is on fire. And then there is torrential rains for 100 years, continuous rain, and everything is emerged in water. That's the actual dissolution of this world. And so he, in that dissolution time, Krishna gave him that, that vision and put him in that situation. And he was floating in this, this uh, dissolution of the cosmic creation. And he was struggling, swimming, trying to stay alive. And this went on for many, many years. Finally, he saw Krishna floating on a banyan leaf, the little baby, when he saw that. And then, of course, after that, everything went down. So the whole thing is an illusion because it's based on these elements which are temporary. And therefore, the whole idea of material existence is a dream. It's a dream. But it's a long dream. It's like Prabhupada used the, the example. When you go to sleep at night, sometimes you dream. And then when you wake up, you come back to your identity and then you begin your activities again on the waking level. But because we're in the material world, even the activities on this material waking level is another form of dream. We're dreaming we're a man, woman, coming from this. In other words, all of the different designations that we adopt is part of this big dream. That's all. And when you wake up, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Jeev Jago, Gola Chanda Bole, Kota Nijan Jayomaya, Pisa Chide, Kole. When you wake up, then you're back in your pure spiritual consciousness. You realize everything that you've been experiencing in this world, material world, was simply a big dream. That's but sometimes we get happy in the dream. <laughs> sometimes dreams are nice, sometimes they're bad. So that's the material world. Sometimes we get a good dream. Sometimes we get a bad dream. But we're dreaming. That's all. <clears throat> and so it doesn't seem like that, right? You say, oh, I'm pinching myself. I'm awake. I can feel it. <laughs> but you're not pinching yourself. You're pinching your body. So yeah, this is, so all of this is due to the contamination of the soul when it comes when it desires to misuse its independence and the whole thing unfolds. So we belong in the spiritual world with Krishna. That's our real home and that's our real identity. We're here in this material world. So Prabhupada said you have to make a best use of a bad bargain. I was explaining how, you know, sometimes there was one great sage I think it was Jamunacharya or someone in relationship to someone in the Sri Sampradaya. He was leaving the body and he was departing the world. And then there was the followers around him. They were mourning their spiritual master's departure. 
And then at one point, he looked at them. He said, I should be crying for you because you have to stay here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it's the message across. <laughs> So yeah, there is another world, but us just talking Baba Yom Yakta Yakta Sanatana. So that that world is Sanatana. It's eternal. It's never created, never annihilated, it exists eternally. And that is the that is the home of us, the living entity. So what do we do while we're here? This the, the purpose of material life is to get us out of the material life. It's like if you get a thorn in your foot, it's like it's in places in Vrindavan, you people walk along the pass and there are many thorns. So a thorn will sometimes come into a person's foot. So in order to get it out, sometimes you have to take another thorn and you pull that thorn out with that thorn and you throw both thorns away. So you use the material world to get out of the material world. And then ultimately, that's the solution to all problems. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so while we here, what we what do we do? We try to get out. So, what does that mean? That means gradually coming to the platform of becoming free from all material desires. Material desires are just like clouds over the soul's existence, and they're ephemeral. They have nothing real about them, although they appear real. Just like if you see smoke floating in the air, you think, oh, there's smoke. It looks, yeah, it looks very nice. And then if, if you try to grab it, try to grab some smoke, what do you get? You see it. Try to, so material life is like that. We're trying to grab onto something here that we think will be, give us some satisfaction, some happiness. But it's ephemeral. It's just the way it is. It just it appears that we. So the real the real grabbing is grabbing Krishna's lotus feet and holding on tight. That's what this verse is saying. Hold on really tight, because material energy is very very mutable. It's always pushing the living entity down. So they say in order to become Krishna consciousness, it's, it's compared to swimming. It's swimming against the current. <clears throat> if you're in a river and you're going against the current, then you have to be a good swimmer. And as soon as you stop swimming, the, the current will push you back down. So, and that's why Krishna consciousness is a constant endeavor to keep our consciousness on Krishna, on devotional service. But it come, becomes, as you practice, it becomes easier and more and more natural. And Srila Prabhupada was asked, you seen Krishna? I, I, there's never a time I wasn't seeing Krishna. At a certain stage of bhakti, it becomes natural and easy. Of course, Maya is still there to test you. But then you're more equipped to pass the tests. But of course, you still have to be careful because this false ego may jump in. So this is the process. <laughs> and what is the solution or what is the safeguard? Sadhu Sangha, association with devotees. In the association of devotees is where we get all of our knowledge, strength, purification, transcendental happiness. Everything is there in the associate. That's why Prabhupada would quote that verse often from the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Saru Sangha, Saru Sangha, Sarva Shastri Hoy, Lava Mata, Saru Sangha, Sarva City Hoy. One moment's association with a great soul, one can be purified from all of one's material contamination accumulated from millions of lifetimes. One moment's association. So then the question will come well, I've had many moments of association with great souls, I'm not purified. So what from that raw verse is a mistake? <laughs> and that question was asked, and Prabhupada response, his response was, when the wood is wet, it doesn't ignite. 
So in other words, we have to dry out a little bit. <laughs> so what is that drying process? Hearing. So we stay in association in doing, continuing practicing Krishna, especially hearing. At one point, then that purification will come. So in the association is the drying process. And then eventually the, the, the fire ignites. So this is our key to making progress in devotional service. Stay in association, especially seek out the association of the advanced devotees, hear from them, and engage in devotional service. And you'll always be in the best position to make advancement in Krishna consciousness. And Maya, and especially Kirtan, because Maya cannot enter into a Kirtan. It's one place she can't go. <laughs> she can go anywhere, but not in the Kirtan. I mean, when the Kirtan is enthusiastic. So it says that, yeah, that's one place she's not allowed in. <laughs> she can't get in. <laughs> because when one is enthusiastically chatting in the glories of the Lord, chanting his holy names, that power pushes back all of the influence of material energy automatically. So you might say, well, what is the fast track for Krishna consciousness? Just do kirtan all the time. <laughs> it works and you'll be Krishna conscious and very quickly. <laughs> it works. But of course we have many other things to do. Just like Prabhupada. Prabhupada heard this one beautiful group of bhajan singers from Vrindavan. Uh, we were in Vrindavan with all the devotees and there was this one group and Prabhupada really liked them. They were really good. So they were chanting so nicely, chanting the glories of the Lord. And Prabhupada was so inspired by their chanting that he said, now we should chant every day, 12 hours a day. <laughs> And the devotees thought, how is that possible? We got so many things to do. You know, we have to manage the temples, we have to take care of the, you know, the, and so many other things. So Prabhupada could, could understand that maybe it wasn't so practical <laughs> as far as our society was. So he said, one day a week, you should have kirtan all day, one day a week. But then he writes in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, where he writes that in each and every one of our temples throughout the world, we should have three hours of kirtan every night. To the Chaitanya Charitamrita, Madhya Lila, chapter three, verse 203. And look up the verse and you'll find in that purport Prabhupada says and he I mean when he writes something in the Chaitanya Charitamrita or the Bhagavatam that's pretty heavy when he puts it in his books because when sometimes people see there are so many contradictions in what Prabhupada may say not parent contradictions. He just speaks according to time, place, and circumstance. But he said, if you really want to know me, read my books. Everything's in my books. And he also said, my books will be the law books for 10,000 years. So if we read and study Prabhupada's books, we'll have a complete understanding of the process of Bhakti and knowledge of the relationship of the living entity with Krishna. And everything's in the books. <clears throat> That's why he spent so much time giving us these books. <clears throat> okay, so so kirtan's very powerful. Bhakti um, Vinod Thakur in uh, Bhajana Rahasya, one of his small presentations, he describes the different anarthas that the living entity is afflicted with. But after describing them and describing the process of how to eliminate the anarthas, he comes to the essence. He says, simply by chanting the holy names of the Lord, then that crushes all of the anarthas. 
That's the most important part of our devotional service, the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. And we have to come to Nam Ruchi too, not just chanting. That means a taste for chanting. That taste has to be coupled with the idea that everything's there in the holy name. Krishna's mercy manifests itself fully in his holy name. Nija Sarma Shaktis. Everything is there in Krishna's name. Okay. Sorry, Krishna. Any questions? Is it in the back? Yes. Maras, thank you very much for the uh, But Maras, you, you're mentioning about Ajamil Pass, right? But nowadays, whenever we travel out in the flights, we see a lot of things all over its media and stuff like that. We don't need Samsung so much in the flight. So, what, can you add some more practical tips? How we can overcome? Don't don't look at him. <laughs> you can't help but noticing him, but if you look at him, that's a different thing. You you notice the environment, but if you look at the environment, then it's a different thing. It's like sometimes we say about brahmachari. A brahmachari can't help but see a woman. But if he looks the second time, then, then he's in trouble. And so in other words, you can't help but noticing what's in the environment. But then again, just don't dwell on it. Just move your consciousness away from it. That's all. And as you fix your consciousness on Krishna and develop that, even though you, you're in the environment, you don't even notice what's going on in the environment. That's a, not, that's a stage of bhakti also. It's there, but it doesn't affect you because you really don't take notice of it at all. And even though you may see it with your eyes, the mind doesn't pick up on it. So we have to practice Krishna consciousness. So when you're traveling, you also have to engage your senses and mind in something spiritual. Try to chant, try to think of Krishna when you're traveling. Uh, do things to keep your consciousness focused. It's like we're riding in the car. Why look out the window all the time and see what kind of billboards are there? I get stuck on that sometimes. But then just chant Hare Krishna while you're riding in the car. If you're not driving, that is. <laughs> if you're driving, if you're driving, then you could be chanting without your beads and still stay calm. I see devotees sometimes when they drive, they don't chant. What are you, why are you, what are you doing? What are you, what, what are you looking at? <laughs> just chant while you're driving. It becomes easier to drive. Krishna drives. <laughs> so yeah, we're surrounded by the material energy and it's also very, it, things can, ha can appear in the material energy by surprise all of a sudden, all of a sudden. You find yourself in a very awkward situation. So be careful. Always remember Krishna. Yes. So uh, in the, uh, the last sentence of this paragraph, uh, there was a very nice order that was given, uh, which is uh, from the uh, uh, fall down from the uh, fall window and the village of the ocean there, specifically, but then you have the, um, the mind, the mind, and then the uh, right. So, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, where the Bhagavad Gita is that, uh, that the modes of material nature are uh, the uh, cause of the different material activities. That right. Like in uh, just on the other side, in Sri Palladi or Vidya Bhushma, in the Govinda Bhashya, so he says that, that if the modes of material nature themselves were the cause of the activities, then how, how would the individual soul be responsible? for the different activities of which they face as karmic reactions. 
So how do we reconcile the the state, the thing of Krishna singing and the most material nature being the uh, cause of our activities versus the different karmic reactions that an individual soul uh, uh, faces for uh, their uh, material activities? Or the other part of that is the reactions are specifically because of the lack of Krishna consciousness in the form and that marginal independence which the living entity uses uh, to uh, to choose the material uh, activity instead of Krishna, and that is the reason for the karmic reaction. So, yeah, you answered it <laughs> somewhat. <clears throat> But your karma is a force that pushes you to think and act in a certain direction. And then according to the nature of that karma, the material energy arises in order to fulfill that desire. So according to the nature of our karma and the desire we have at the present time, we're, we're bringing about a particular mode of material nature. And, and so, that, so that sense object, is a reflection of our, our, our desire. That's so therefore we're being pushed. Therefore one has to keep, keep the mind on something spiritual in order for that karma not to push us towards a certain sense object, which, is, which will arise in the material energy due to our desire. So sometimes Krishna knows or the material energy knows what is your material desire. And that'll present. Sometimes devotees say, you know, I wonder why I'm getting challenged the same way all the time. Because that's 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 where your weak point is. Maya will attack you where you're weak. Wherever you're the most weakest point, the example is given, yeah, <clears throat> two people are fighting. And then if one person injures another person, the fight is still going on. That injury in that place becomes the vulnerable spot for that person. And then the other opponent tries to hit in that same area. So Maya is like that. She knows where you're weak and she'll hit you there just to make you strong. <laughs> not, to do, not to make you fall down, but to make you aware of whatever your weakness is and so you can become more attentive to uh, overcome those. So these things arise simply by your own desires. <laughs> yeah, which are fueled by our previous karma or our personal desires like that. And even, even great devotees, just like devotees will say, I mean, we devote, a devotee will have uh, attachment to a certain type of food stuff. But Krishna, Maya will come and bring that in food stuff all the time. Say if you like pizza, then everywhere you go, everyone wants to make pizza for you. <laughs> if you like something else, that comes up. So that's just the way it is, just to help you become aware of your own you know, we say idiosyncrasies, which are which are subtle aspects of our karma or our actual desires. So the only way you can overcome that is think of Krishna. Think of think of the spiritual energy, and be aware that these things are simply uh, uh, attempts by the material energy to track your mind in that way. But it's not always easy because the force we need to overcome these things is something we have to really work on. Because the force of our karma is pushing us in a certain way to think and act. Now, then, for a devotee, that's called parabdha karma. That, that karma, which is manifesting yet still from our previous activities that are, are due to our attachments. And that is something that we have to be aware of and then eliminate. So Krishna will allow you to see that all the time. So you can somehow or other overcome that. It's when you're not aware of the enemy, then you're in trouble. Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Thank you.
Thank you for the question. It was a brahmachari class. <laughs> but you're all brahmacharis in different dresses here. So what I would understand from your class is that uh, the real solution to overcoming Maya is Ruchi, is taste for devotional service. Ultimately, the Visayam Vinivartan Day, Niharasya Day, you know, you know that verse? Prasopyasya Pavyom Vartam Varam Trusva Nivartam. When you get a higher taste, then you can give up the lower taste. But taste is life. So without taste, there's no life. So if you're if you're in a space, if you haven't developed a higher taste yet, you're still maybe attracted to the lower taste. But then again, you have to somehow, we call it perform austerities to get over that till that higher taste develops. So, in that particular purport of Vishavi Purport, the Prabhupada says, uh, when one becomes attracted in the course of one's devotions, when one but attracted by attracted by the beauty of Lord Krishna, then uh, one become gives up the taste for all favorite materials, something like that. Yeah. yeah. So that's the only way. So how to situate oneself? Because sometimes when God flashes may come of the deity of the kid, how to situate oneself in that or how to qualify for that? Well, when you take darshan of the deity, take a mental photo and try to keep that photo in and out. And then of course, there's two powerful forces that are chanting of the holy names, and meditating on and thinking of Krishna's lotus feet. These things, and these things are both extremely powerful and can push back any force of mind. Prabhupada explains that he said, if you're if you're thinking of the lotus feet of the Lord, you will never be impeded in any of your activities and devotions. Simply by thinking of Krishna's lotus feet. You can get through all of the obstacles in devotional service if you're th actually thinking about Krishna's lotus feet. Because it, that means you're bringing Krishna there. And the way we approach Krishna is through the feet, which means devotional service. Sorry, I just need clarification. So, Krishna's lotus feet are for one to be. Uh, yeah. So, one to be situated on the platform of attraction, I mean, any kind of attraction, attraction, concept of attraction to the name, to the form, etc. So, what is the qualification? What should I do so that maybe six months, one year, sometime down the line, I can be situated on the platform? Yeah, you have to be convinced that there's no happiness in this material. If you think there's a little bit of happiness, and you can't stay focused on Krishna. It's not possible. You have to be convinced that there's no happiness, zero. If you think that there's something here that is that is beneficial for you in terms of the material energy, that blocks your progress in spiritual. And that's why Prabhupada said devotional service begins when you realize there's no happiness here. Then you begin your spiritual life. Because if you're still looking to two sides, you know, it's like, you know, it's like trying to build a fire and throw water on it at the same time. But you have to be convinced there's no happiness. Here. And if you're not convinced, keep reading the books. <laughs> The books explain that principle from different angles of vision so you can understand it in, in different ways, the same point. So, why do you speak about theoretical conviction? 
Say, uh, what is the question? Like that conviction that you're speaking about. So, one type of conviction is out of realization that sometimes is there. That, yeah, it's actually useless. Another kind of conviction is just theoretical. So, you're speaking about theory. Well, yeah, but theory theory leads to realization. If you don't have this, you don't have the gyan, you can't get vigyan. You have to start with gyan. Gyan means transcendental knowledge. Vigyan means realization of that knowledge. And so the process of devotional service means we practice. So as you go through the different stages of bhakti, you're coming to the level of realization. And you're also realizing the different elements of bhakti as you perform devotional service. You have maybe at one point you realize, well, I'm not this body. I finally got it. So these realizations come by the execution of devotional service. If you are following the process, if you're committing offenses or if you're acting outside of the instructions that are given for the execution of devotional service, you're minimizing the effects of those activities. That's why Krishna explained to Brahma in the very end of the Brahma Samhita, you can see, Krishna said three things for success in devotional service. He said, perseverance in practice, following scriptural injunctions, and what was it? The other one was behavior. Uh, uh, I, by, uh, ideal Vaishnav behavior. Perfect behaviors following scriptural injunctions, perseverance in practice. That's why determination is one of the features that Rupa Goswami emphasizes in the execution of the way. He says, Utsahan Nishchaya Darya. Utsahan means enthusiasm. That means to endeavor with intelligence. Determination means when obstacles come, or just the ex, one has to uh, overcome it by, by transcendental knowledge, and then one can move forward. Oh, there's Maya. Oh yeah, it looks good, but I know it's just Maya. That's we worship Lord Nisringadev to destroy material illusions. That's one of the elements that Bhakti Vinodha Court gives. He gives three points that by the worship of the Sringadev, he shows you that that's an illusion. He helps you understand what you're attracted to materially is not really what you're looking for. That's why we worship the Sringadev. That's one of the reasons. The other one, he protects from material dangers also. He's our friend, good friend. So, yeah. Right, please bless that I can, I can situate another platform. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Blessings come in different manifest, in different ways. When Prabhupada would be asked, give me your blessings, Prabhupada would say, I'm giving you, just take it. <laughs> You're not taking it, you might think he's not giving it, but he is. <laughs> Some people don't want the blessings. You know the story? You mentioned it in the other, we were talking. So Prabhupada was in India and one very, this after a lecture, a very nicely dressed man and woman came to see Prabhupada. Very pukka, cultured, nicely dressed. He came up and the man said, Swamiji, give me your blessings. 
And Prabhupada looked at them and said, you don't want my blessings. <laughs> no, no, Swamiji, please give me your blessings. Prabhupada says, you don't want my blessings. <laughs> No, no, Swami, please give your to us. All right, I, I bless you, your material life is finished. <laughs> and then they just drifted into the crowd and that was that. <laughs> so do you really want the blessings? <laughs> you have to make sure you want them because when you ask for them, it may come in a way that you're not expecting it. Yeah, so I can't give you blessings, but I know there are people who can. <laughs> His name is God, <laughs> Krishna, and they also call him Krishna, <laughs> and Sila Prabhupada, and many, many great souls who have come in the line of Krishna. And their, their words, their life examples, all of them are ways we can derive great blessings. But if you really want blessings, there's one way to bring about all blessings immediately. And that is one word, sincerity. Sincerity. I want Krishna, nothing else. If you, sincerity comes from a word in the Latin, which, uh, explain sculptor when a person is making a sculpture they're using their tools to very finely cut different angles into the form that they have in mind how to do it everything is very precise in the way that art is being executed so that's that's that word that i can't remember the latin word but sincerity comes from that latin the same thing. That's how you have to execute devotion service, very sincerely. It's not just, you know, whenever it's convenient. Therefore, we say that it's 24 7. If you practice, you'll get, you'll be good at it. Don't get discouraged by if you slip or if you don't come up to the stand. If you, if you get discouraged by that, and then that minimizes your ability to succeed. Just learn from your mistakes and then try to see what was it that caused you to think or act in the wrong way. And then move forward, and get away from that. That's sincerity. We learn from, from our mistakes or from our, well, we say, what's the word? Our inability to come up to the standard at that particular time. Mm -hmm. Just like the other day, I'll, I'll, I'll admit one of my, an artist. <laughs> People were trying to give me a chair to sit down and I didn't want to sit down. I was standing next to Yugula and he was chanting and I wanted to sit, stand next to him. And people were coming up with chairs. And I said, no, push the chair away. And then another person came up with a chair and I said, no, I don't want that chair. And then somebody else came with the chair. So I just ran away and went to the other side. So at one point I got kind of angry. <laughs> I was ready to throw the chair at him, but I didn't. So I failed the test because I got angry. I didn't express the anger, but I just kind of like, <laughs> why did they keep giving me a chair? You know? <laughs> I'm not the chairman, you know. <laughs> So that was a test. Krishna was testing. It wasn't the people's fault. Krishna was saying, hey, here's the test for you. See if you can pass it. 
and I failed. I got angry. I shouldn't, if I, by not getting angry, I would have passed the test, but I got angry. <laughs> so yeah, so sometimes we find ourselves in a situation. And then I, then I said to Krishna, oh my God, I got angry. I'm sorry, Krishna. Krishna was just smiling anyway. <laughs> so, so yeah, we get tested. We get tested. And then sometimes these tests are opportunities for overcoming some of our anarthas. So be aware of that. If you slip, just get back up. Learn from the mistake and then go on. Does that help? Yeah. Don't get discouraged by fall by slips, but be very you know, be very careful. And after a while, you'll learn how to avoid these things. It's a learning process. If you're sincere, you'll learn fast. If you're insincere, then you won't learn. Yes, in the back. And so uh, sometimes this has we we realize that we don't have any strength to pass this test knowledge. So uh, at that point uh, like and praying next. intensely to Krishna and yeah. even sometimes uh, even after praying intensely, uh, I mean we don't come out of those kind of situations which we have no control. So uh, I don't understand like what 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 is the I mean how, how can we take those kind of situations and how can we come out from uh, like even after praying intensely? So, you mean you mean by praying you didn't get any help? I don't think you recognize how the help came. It comes when you pray, you actually get help. If it's actually a test, if it's not a test, it may not it may not you might not. Really, just you might be thinking it's actually a test, but it's not. But when you pray, Krishna's there. He's always there, if the prayer is sincere. He doesn't neglect his devotee. He helps his devotee. But maybe your prayer was conditional. You have to see if it was sincere, that you actually want his help. But maybe his help came in a way that you couldn't see. Sometimes in some difficult situation, you may have to just leave the situation in order to be free from the effects of what's happening. And then part of, the, part of responding to the test is also on using your intelligence on how to. The prayer is always appropriate. It's always appropriate. Krishna saved me. That's a, a quick prayer that you can say. Just like Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, you can't chant your rounds attentively unless you pray to chant your rounds attentively. You can't, it's not possible. You have to, every day before you chant your rounds, you have to pray for attentive chanting. And then you can, then you're in a position to chant attentively. Still, you have to work on it, though. But if you don't pray, it's not possible. That happened to me this morning. I pray every morning. This morning, I forgot. And then I was I was really struggling. I got to the sixth round. And it was like they took me forever to get to the sixth round. Then I realized I didn't have, I didn't pray for chant to, to chant attentively. And so I offered a prayer, which I usually always do. And then things were different after. You have to pray. It's just the way it is. Prayer helps you to understand that you're dependent. We're dependent. If we think we're okay, then we may be KO'd instead of okay. <laughs> yes. Actually, we have today 
Okay. Yeah. Here we got Divya here in the front. He's been really eager to ask this question. So we are starting the book distribution from Kagano. So we can take breakfast and come in from the assembly. Then Your last question. Yes, I'll be real quick. Thank you so much for the wonderful class, Maharaj. You, if towards the end, you emphasize on patience. We we emphasize so much on lovelier. It apparently, and, and at least in my brain, I feel lovelier and patience are two opposite poles. How do I solve that person? Well, first, lovelier, then patience. First, laudium, then patience. They, patience follows them. Because if you're if you're in that mood of laudium, then it may not come all of a sudden. You have to require requires a little patience. And Krishna will respond, but in due course of time. But laudium is is. Those who don't know what lie means, means intense eagerness. That's what it is, intense eagerness. But still, there has to be the element of patient in there. Just because you're eager and it's intense, doesn't mean these results are gonna happen right away. Yeah. So don't drop the lalium because the, in favor of patience. Because that's the means by which you attract the attention. Okay, thank you. Srimad Bhagavatam, he. Yeah.